I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel is set to meet with Egypt and the EU to try to resolve the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The U.S. Secretary of State claims the Palestinian Authority has stopped paying terrorists and will reveal how an Israeli celebrity chef is planning on feeding thousands of hungry Israeli kids. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The Gaza Strip is set to get as little as two and a half hours of electricity a day because Israel has agreed to stop paying the PA's electricity bill. And now it looks like the Jewish state is about to enter talks with the European Union and Egypt to find a solution. Egypt is offering to provide Gaza with around 20 megawatts of electricity per day. But Egypt has its own set of demands. The neighboring country is demanding the extradition of 17 terrorists who are wanted in Cairo. Israel, on the other hand, has been trying to distance itself from the electricity crisis in the Gaza Strip, with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying it's a Palestinian problem and that Israel has no interest in any escalation. <laughs> החמאס דורש שהרשות הפלסטינית תממן את החשמל, והרשות הפלסטינית מסרבת לשלם. זהו נושא לוויכוח פלסטיני פנימי. On Sunday, the Security Cabinet announced that it would follow Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's demand to cut power to the region. Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority and the Fatah Party, is seeking to increase the pressure on rival Palestinian organization Hamas and reign in the Gaza Strip under the auspices of the Palestinian Authority. The fear is that in doing so, however, he'll just further destabilize the coastal enclave. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is already extremely difficult. وانتو شايفين وضع الناس بنجيب لنا وقت اللحم نحطها في الثلاجة تخرب الصبح نكبها مرممة نلفة المية متلجة مش تهيين نشربها مش تهيين نشرب نلفة المية بنحط الفاكهة الخضرة بنجيب الجبنة البزيل الأسبوع اللي فات والله العظيم كبيتها انها خربت وكبيتها بدل واحد يشرب له كباية عصير مسقعة تبل ريق وبعد هالس يوم ونشبعنا ريق طول النهار ما مش تهيينها الحياة ميتة لأنه هالقيت احنا يعني بنطلع لأنفسنا أكلنا وشربنا وحالنا وشغلنا ما فيش لا شغل ولا في أكل ولا في شرب يعني الأكل اللي بيزيد عنا وإحنا صايبين بنحطه بالتلاجة تاني يوم الصبح بدنا نطلع المغرب بلاقي إيش ما يعني محمد وهالقيت إحنا والله ما إحنا عارفين إيش بدنا نسوي Hamas is claiming the decision will have disastrous and dangerous results so maybe now the EU is willing to pick up the Palestinian authorities to have the battle to end the Palestinian Authority's practice of paying salaries to jailed terrorists and their families continues. And now some exciting news is coming from the U.S. State Department. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more. Aaron? Well, honestly, the United States has been trying to keep money ending up as a terrorist salary for a long time. Uh, in March 2016, former United States officer uh, in the Army Taylor Force was stabbed to death right here in Tel Aviv, which prompted the reintroduction of what has become known as the Taylor Force Act, which would stop payments to the Palestinian Authority as long as the PA is paying terrorism. Um, and, you know, that's just one example of the United States trying to do something about this issue. And the PA's payment reward system has been at the heart of or has been a major contributor to the 177 stabbing attacks, 117 attempted stabbings, 144 shootings, 58 ramming attacks, and one bus bombing that have taken place in Israel only since September 2015, when the so-called knife uh, stabbing at Tifada began. So anyway, I'll tell you more in my report. In some surprising news from Washington, United States Secretary of State Rex Tillerson told senators yesterday that the Palestinian Authority will no longer pay jailed terrorists and their families. He said they have changed that policy and their intent is to cease the payments to the families of those who have committed murder or violence against others, and we have been very clear with them that this practice is simply not acceptable to us. According to the White House, the issue was first brought up between United States President Trump and PA President Abbas when they met in early May. 
Later, during his trip to the West Bank, Trump told Abbas again that peace can never take root in an environment where violence is tolerated, funded, or rewarded. Despite the confident rhetoric coming from the Trump administration, however, Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman has responded to Secretary Tillerson's statements, saying he didn't see any indication that the Palestinian Authority stopped or intends to stop payments to terrorists and terrorists' families. Israel, too, though, has recently been trying to deal with the issue. The Knesset has already advanced through the first reading of a bill that would cut tax returns to the PA by the same amount that they used to pay imprisoned terrorists. A report in the Knesset last month estimated that in just four years, the PA has paid over $1.1 billion to terrorists and their families for their acts against people in Israel, military and civilian alike. Joining me today in the studio to discuss ISIS's recruitment of Arab Israelis is Ariel Koch, a researcher at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. So let's start with the general question. How common of an issue is this, Arab Israelis joining ISIS? First, we know about uh, tens uh, Israelis, some something like uh, 60 Israelis who joined ISIS, uh, whether in Sinai Peninsula or in Syria and Iraq. We know about something like uh, 100 Israelis who got arrested by the uh, Shin Bet here in Israel. And we know that uh, the idea, the, ideolo ide the religious ideology of ISIS is spreading among Arab Israelis. Interesting. So talk, us, talk to us a little bit about what attracts Arab Israelis to ISIS or the Arab Israelis who have tried to join ISIS. Uh, first and foremost, we can see that the dissatisfaction with movements like uh, Hamas, such as Hamas, uh, bring uh, other Israelis, uh, Arabs, extremists to join, uh, to join uh, ISIS and or Al-Qaeda. And uh, furthermore, we can see that the pan-Islamism, the idea of revival, the uh, caliphate, the ancient caliphate, is still uh, strong among many, many uh, Arabs here. Uh, when, when you say, you know, that, that this pan-Islamism and people are really getting more attracted to ISIS ideologies, are you speaking of Arab Israelis within Israel proper, or Gaza, the Palestinian authorities, or both equally? I'm talking only about uh, Arab Israelis, I mean Israeli citizens. Right. Uh, in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, we have uh, other problems because of the Hamas, the uh, Hamas regime, uh, which is, uh, he don't like the idea of uh, others to, uh, who might take control in the Gaza Strip. Now, how is ISIS able to get in contact with these, you know, Arab Israelis who are interested in joining their so-called movement? Exactly like uh, in Europe or in the U.S. or in Australia or the Philippines. I mean, uh, via the social networks, uh, Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. Telegram, nowadays mainly Telegram. And it's uh, much easier, it's cheap, and uh, anyone can get in touch uh, with uh, any other person all over the world. Now, are there any projections as to how much of an issue this is? I mean, we know the number you said it was 60, or right, like around yeah. 60. You know, is this going to be a growing issue? Is this something that, you know, the Israeli government sees increasing in the future? It is an increasing problem. And uh, we can see because uh, year after year, there are more people who got arrested by the Shin Bet and Israeli uh, forces. Is, what is Israel doing to, con you know, to combat this issue and try to, you know, nip it at its bud? First, uh, we must do monitor, and I think that the Shin Bet uh, is doing that uh, very, very fine, very well. And we need to monitor their uh, communication. We need to monitor uh, Telegram channels, the uh, Twitter channels, etc. And uh, secondly, we need to we need to fight with uh, education. We need to spread the idea that this kind of ideology is wrong, and it's bring disaster mostly for Muslim people all over the world. Now, what is Hamas's relationship or, you know, opinion about ISIS as a whole? Uh, ISIS and Hamas are uh, rivals. I mean, they disagree uh, upon many, many subjects. For example, the idea of uh, nationality. Uh, Hamas uh, speaks about uh, building an Islamic state, but in Palestine. And ISIS, uh, on the other hand, speaking about worldwide uh, caliphate. And it's uh, forbid the idea of uh, nationalism and uh, uh, the idea of the state in general. Interesting. Well, I'm, I mean, I think we just are all hoping here that there is going to be something done to combat this issue. I and hope hopefully to. these numbers are not going to grow. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. A Palestinian teenager has been arrested for pulling a knife on a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem. And he's telling police he did it because they were teasing him. 
The incident took place at a bakery where he says he brandished a knife in order to scare them off. He's been arrested along with his father, who is a co-worker at the bakery. Since an initial investigation is indicating that neither of the Palestinians had a valid work permit, the owner of the Bar Ilan Street Bakery is also being arrested for employing someone who's not permitted to cross the green line. And he's now being accused of employing a minor who's an illegal alien in violation of Israeli labor laws. After yet another United Nations human rights report was released condemning Israel, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley is again defending Israel on the world stage. ILTV's Aaron Porras is back in the newsroom with more. Aaron, take it away. What, what, what is it this time? I mean, to be honest, I'd be lying if I told you that this was a new problem. Unfortunately, uh, this is a classic story at the United Nations. Syria is still burning. ISIS is spreading its message of hate. You know, Venezuela is having their own difficulties, and yet they're looking at Israel again, uh, you know, completely disproportionately condemning Israel. Thankfully, at least now, we have uh, Nikki Haley, the United Nations ambassador from the United States, who has said that she is going to, who's promised, she's going to defend us. She's our new, she's our new sheriff in town. You know, it looks like it's uh, high noon. Basically. Well, let's check out your report. All right. The United States ambassador to the UN is slamming Monday's report from the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, saying it again singles out Israel while ignoring the world's actual human rights abusers. Along with that, Haley says it undermines the credibility of the Human Rights Council on human rights issues. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Zaid Ra'ad al Hussein, a Jordanian prince, accused Israel of denying the Palestinians many of their most fundamental freedoms. Of course, Haley's been threatening to pull the U.S. from the UNHRC if they continue these practices. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has even told her it's time to shut down UNRWA, a U.N. agency that serves several generations of Palestinian refugees. Last week, she said that the HRC's relentless pathological campaign against Israel makes a mockery not of Israel, but of the Council itself. The question is, is Haley planning a gesture to match her words? Ever since the Palestinian Football Association got into FIFA, they've been trying to get Israel censored or even expelled. They want the International Football League to stop Israeli teams from playing in Palestinian territory, and they want it to happen now. FIFA has been saying that it's premature to make a final decision on Israeli clubs at play in West Bank settlements. They claim that the chairman of FIFA's Israel-Palestine Monitoring Committee, Tokyo Sexuale, is reporting on the situation. The PFA is calling the postponement null and void, though, and is demanding that FIFA be ordered to immediately vote on the issue. Israel says the PFA is trying to use soccer to establish borders and is pointing out that the PFA president, Jibril Rajoub, is also a member of Fatah's Central Committee. The president of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, is predicting that the organization will make a decision about the Israeli teams in October. The Russian ambassador to Israel is refusing to call Hamas and Hezbollah terrorist organizations, saying that under Russian law, only organizations that attack Russia or Russian interests can be considered terrorists. LTV correspondent Max Keisler has more. Max, why is the Russian ambassador saying this? Well, you know, when you look at Russia's foreign policy, it always adv does one thing. It advances Russian interests, and that's regardless of principle. So for Russia, you know, they're allied with Iran. They're not going to go and call Hezbollah, which is Iran's proxy, a terrorist organization. That would be a gift to Israel. That would really antagonize things with Iran. What Russia wants to do here is maintain good relations with Israel and with Iran. Now, how can they do that? It's clear that Israel and Iran are opposing each other. Well, it's complicated. You know, at the same time that Russia is um, backing Iran and Hezbollah in the Syrian civil war, they're not stopping the Israeli Air Force from um, striking uh, Hezbollah armed convoys going from Syria to Lebanon, bringing weapons. And they're, um, they're selling weapons to Iran. They're selling weapons to Hezbollah. But it seems like they don't really care if Hezbollah receives all the weapons they sell to them. Alexander Sheen, the Russian ambassador to Israel, says that Russia does not consider Hezbollah and Hamas to be terrorist groups. In a June 9th interview with the Russian-language Israeli Channel 9, Sheen conceded that the groups are radical organizations which sometimes adhere to extremist political views. However, he says that Russian law defines terrorist organizations as those which intentionally conduct acts of terror in Russian territory or against Russian interests abroad. Russian-Israeli relations are closer than they've ever been, with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu regularly flying to Moscow to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. But Russia's alliance with Iran is a cornerstone of its foreign policy. The ambassador's words are definitely meant for Iranian ears, too. Just this year, Russia delivered the sophisticated S-300 missile defense system to the Islamic Republic, after years of delays. 
As always, Russian actions speak louder than words. It's been more than half a year since Israel and New Zealand had a huge diplomatic falling out after New Zealand co-sponsored an anti-Israel UN Security Council resolution. But Israel has just announced that it's resuming full ties with the Oceanic nation. The foreign ministry has announced the diplomatic renewal just one day after New Zealand Prime Minister Bill English sent a letter to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. English expressed regret over how Israeli-New Zealand ties were damaged by the resolution. Israel has recently restored full diplomatic relations with Senegal, another co-sponsor of the resolution, and another country that Israel had permanently downgraded diplomatic ties with in response. New Zealand and Israel have a reciprocal agreement that allows travelers to work in each other's countries for up to three months visa-free. Trade between the two countries is growing, too. Now, diplomatic spats won't get in the way of that. Chaim Cohen was one of the first Israeli chefs to focus on turning Middle Eastern cuisine into gourmet food. And now he's got a new job, only this time it's to help hungry kids get school breakfasts. Cohen is now the public face of Nevet's social media campaign. The Israeli organization provides some 8,000 impoverished Israeli students with 1.3 million breakfasts a year. But there are almost 13,000 more on the wait list. Cohen's on YouTube now asking American Jews to face the unpleasant truth that many children are going to school hungry and coming back famished. He says that when he prepares sandwiches for his own children, it's one of the most joyful moments as a father, giving them the power to learn better and to be proud. Sadly, far too many children don't get to experience that. If you'd like to contribute to the cause, donate at nevet.org. כבר דואגת לאותם ילדים, ואנחנו צריכים אתכם בשביל זה. אי אפשר לעשות את זה לבד. זה האינטרס של כל אחד ואחד מאיתנו כדי להשאיר כאן עולם הרבה יותר יפה ממה שקיבלנו לילדים שלנו. Online shopping can be a hassle, especially if you're trying to order something from abroad. First, you have to figure out if the company you're ordering from even ships to your country, and then you have to start calculating shipping and import taxes. Well, one Israeli startup has just found a way around all of that. Joining me today in the studio is Amiel Ries, the CMO of Zippy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Now, I'm excited to hear about this because I know exactly what it's like to order something from abroad and not have it arrive to my house because the, the process is just so complicated. So what does Zippy do? Okay. Zippy provides a simple shopping experience from international websites like eBay, AliExpress, Amazon, and Deal Extreme. Um, we provide a service uh, for our customers that enables them to search uh, any product from this uh, shopping uh, websites. Uh, they can uh, search, order, and track the shi shipping in a local language, in Hebrew. In Israel, it's in Hebrew. Um, we have a, um, what you said about shipping. We provide a service uh, to ship any product that uh, even doesn't ship to Israel. Uh, we ship it to Israel uh, from our warehouse in uh, the United States. So what companies does Zippy work with right now? Um, we provide the serv shopping services from eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, and Deal Extreme. Wow, okay, so that's... And we the plan to add uh, ASOS uh, soon. Oh, wow, <laughs> that is exciting for all the women, I think, that are coming from uh, at least North America and Europe because ASOS is a big brand. Now, uh, Zippy, you said ships to multiple, multiple different countries, not only Israel, right? We started uh, Zippy in Israel four years ago, and a few months ago we started Zippy in Romania, in Romania. Right. Uh, and in Russia, in Russian, okay. and we plan to start uh, Zippy in other uh, uh, countries in uh, local languages like Italy, Spain, uh, Georgia, and other countries. Interesting. Now, here's a question. Let's say you order something, and I mean, this is something that has happened to me personally. I'll order something, and for some reason, it doesn't arrive to my address, and it goes back to the Israeli post office, which can be com you know, complicated for me to navigate as yeah. well. Do you help with that process? Yeah, so our main value for our customers is that we give them uh, customer support uh, in Hebrew, in their local language, mm -hmm. so they don't have the difficulties to uh, communicate in English with eBay or the suppliers in uh, AliExpress in English, and uh, we provide all the services also with the Israeli post office. Um, 
so all the uh, orders will arrive home. <laughs> so I guess the question is, what do you do for all the Olim Kadashim or new immigrants here who don't speak Hebrew, uh, right? That's a whole other thing that so you have to work on. So we plan on. now, uh, like we did uh, ZP in Russia in Russian, to translate uh, uh, ZP in Israel, inside Israel, to Russian and Arabic and uh, maybe Spanish. I mean, I honestly think that's a big deal because most of the time people are ordering things from abroad. I mean, obviously there are people who are ordering products online from Israel, but I mean, there are so many of us foreigners who are trying to order things online because we can't find them here in Israel, right? So we're dealing kind of with the stress of losing an item that you thought you ordered to your house and then having to deal with the difficult Hebrew and the post office and the bureaucracy. So, you know, it's so, definitely something you should focus on. Now, yeah, you how can did talk to us also in English and we will help exactly. you. Exactly. Well, how did you come up with this idea as a whole? Um, the partners of the company met as students four years ago and they, uh, in a small talk in a pub on a beer, uh, talked about that, that their parents asked them to buy stuff uh, from eBay because they have difficulties to uh, order by themselves. Um, so they uh, uh, find a solution that will fit not only their parents, all the, all the Israelis who have problems and mm -hmm. difficulties with uh, language or even uh, um, credit cards. We accept local credit cards that eBay doesn't accept wow. or AliExpress. So uh, as a final project for the studies. They started uh, the website uh, just with eBay and it's grew up to be a company. So what's next for the company? Um, so like I said, we plan to uh, start Zippy in other uh, countries, developing countries in uh, East Europe, uh, maybe Brazil and uh, other countries. Well, it seems like you guys are having a lot of success so far, and I'm glad that I know you exist for all my future online orders, but thank you so much for coming in. Thank Amiel you. Ries. Thank you very much. Israel, along with most of the world, was shaken when Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel passed away last year. But now it looks like the beloved Jewish figure is going to be honored in an entirely new way. The writer, professor, and political activist will now have a street corner named after him in New York City. ILTV's Aaron Porras is back with more details. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so it seems like the southwest corner of West 84th Street and Central Park West has been permanently co-named Elie Wiesel Way. It's a very exciting time, you know, to celebrate a man who did really so much. Honestly, so like, for me well, personally, I mean, yeah, he's a, it's it's a powerful memorial to. And I think I think for a lot of us, I mean, he was definitely a, a huge influencer in my mm -hmm. life. And as a New York native, oh, yeah. this is really exciting news for me too to know that there's a place that is going sure. to be honoring and representing him. So, let's check out your report. That's his grandson Elijah says he's surprised the street isn't on the Upper East Side because that's where Wiesel lived and died. But other family members are happy with the location. It's the neighborhood where Wiesel had his first home and family life since the Holocaust. Wiesel, who was famed for his first-person memoirs of his time in Auschwitz, was a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize and a crusader against genocide in Sudan. He came to the United States in 1955 after a period of Zionist activism in France after the Holocaust. Along with Primo Levi, he is seen as the definitive writer of the Holocaust. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so today's word is Auchat Bokel, which surprise, surprise, means breakfast in Hebrew. I don't know about you, but one of the main reasons that I love sleeping is because it's like a time machine to Auchat Bokel. Let's be honest, much of our happiness depends on what we eat, and starting your day off with a hearty and healthy Auchat Bokel is probably the best way to go. Here in Israel, though, forget pancakes and waffles. Breakfast food can often include salad, olives, salty cheese, and even chakshuka, which is like a heavy tomato sauce with eggs. After all, it's important to eat every meal like it's your last, especially if it's Auchat Bokel. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy with a low of 70 or 21 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect more clouds and no significant change in temperature with a high of 83 or 28 degrees. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.52 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.